So my name is Indy. I am a data, science at, data scientist at MAPSEN. I have a background in geography. I've actually been studying geography for nearly 20 years. I can't believe it's been this long. Um, I've attended many of the schools in Southern California that are known for geography. And while I was at UCSB, I remember my good child writing a paper about um, citizens as, um, um, as uh, sensors. And we did a lot of study about um, OpenStreetMap at the time, and I thought, wow, this is really interesting, and I wonder if I'll ever come across this again, and like, here I am now, and this is what I do for a living, is, is uh, work, do a lot of work with OpenStreetMap data and the community. So I'm really excited to present to you um, a, a series of blog posts that we have at the MAPSEN, at MAPSEN uh, on our website. So a series, well, what exactly is this series to begin with? For those of you that may not be familiar with the targeted editing series, it's a set of blog posts. And it features a, a location in the world that we're highlighting, but it's meant to encourage people to edit anywhere in the world. And we're trying to keep on a regular schedule, and the best laid plans always get changed of my idea of let's make a post every third Thursday or, or every third week of the month, and it just never really kind of works out that way. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the madness in the background that causes the schedule to be crazy. Uh, it includes some statistics, usually they're just summary statistics, telling you how many of a particular feature is present in the data, whatever we're highlighting and it includes maps. Everybody loves a map, and these maps highlight the features that are presented as part of the post. And what we really would wanted to do is give people a venue to edit, so we've linked those features with ID and JAWSM so that it's really easy for you to find those features and edit them. And we're in good company, so we're, not, we're definitely not the only um, entity that has been trying to engage editors. We've been inspired by so many other efforts. Uh, Map Roulette, I am so addicted to that. It's like you go to Map Roulette and you can just edit for hours without even realizing, oh my gosh, it's been two hours. It's a good thing I get paid to do this. <laughs> but there's also Map Time. Uh, there's the OSM quarterly goals. There are a lot of initiatives that are trying to get people to edit. And if you want to know how many we have, well, we have 13 posts in the series. And the very first one was in December of 2015, and it was the, uh, the streets without names. And it highlighted segments of roads that did not have a name tag. Uh, and then we've had several others that were related to uh, points of interest. There were some that were related to different types of, um, of routing and different areas of search, um, I really encourage you to check them out. They're all, they're all quite interesting. Uh, but before I get further into this talk, you're probably wondering, like, what's the motivation? Why, why start a series of uh, blog posts that are trying to get editors to identify specific features within OpenStreetMap? And what we've discovered, and it's, it's, it's well understood, that a lot of the new editors that are coming to OpenStreetMap are coming from areas that are very heavily edited. It's like, it's, you, you get started and you're like, wow, I mean, what is there for me to edit? It just seems like everything is already represented. And so if your first introduction to OpenStreetMap looks like this, you click the edit button, you're like, wow, Oh, oh my goodness, this is very intimidating. Um, but the reality is, is that there are so many things left that would benefit from an edit. And a lot of these things are things that don't show up in, from a rendering perspective. They could be extra attributes or extra tags. Like for businesses, it could be the address, it could be the type of cuisine if it's a restaurant, it could be, um, additional things like websites or URLs, or it could be names. It could just be that there's a building and it doesn't have a name. So this talk, this talk is broken into three categories of, uh, that contribute to making the targeted editing series. I call them the three T's, the topics, the tags, and the tiles. So if we start with the topics, it's really easy to get lost because there's so many tags. If you are curious about how many unique tags there are um, in the OpenStreetMap database, it has exceeded 
80 million, I believe, the last time I looked on, um, uh, at the statistics for the tags, it's overwhelming. But we decided, let's just break this down into use cases. And if we're just looking at routing, display, and search, we can definitely bucket different types of features to um, encourage people to edit. So if we start with routing, we might have things that are related to transportation, like driving. We might have things related to um, transit or bike riding. And the first thing that we thought would be a really straightforward thing to encourage people to edit were names. So we call it the streets without names, but it's really the street segments without names. And what we do in the post is not only do we emphasize this particular characteristic of the data, but we also want to give people some understanding of how this characteristic of the data is used for, um, in different applications. So as you know, if, you're, if you have a routing engine and you're doing turn-by-turn -turn routing and you happen to turn on a segment that that particular segment doesn't have the name, then all you get is turn right in 500 feet. And it would be so much better if it said turn right on Smith Street or whatever the case may be. So as we highlight those roads that, or those segments of roads that don't have names, it starts to look very overwhelming. This happens to be um, New Delhi. And you're probably thinking, is that right? Are there really that many segments that don't have names? That seems, that seems crazy. Um, and, and it does, but on the surface, it's, it, there's, there's so much positive here that is hard to envision if you just look at it on the surface. What you really have to do is break down to see what types of roads are, um, are missing those names on the segments. And so if we break that down, and on this graph, I'm just showing the primary roads and the, um, and the motorways, which are the highest level roads, there's just a small percentage of those, of the total kilometers that are missing the names. So we're actually doing quite well in the, this particular subset of cities in Asia. And um, I have quite a few more cities also in Europe and in North America that are being reported on a, uh, in a blog post that I encourage you to check out. So once we've, we've talked about um, our routing, we also have some opportunities to encourage people to edit things that are more geared towards display. And these things you would think would be very accessible. People recognize how this might change the map for positive purposes. And here I have this really great example of a convention center in Portugal. Uh, I don't know how washed out this is for those of you that are sitting halfway back and, and beyond, but it is just incredible. It's so well mapped. Um, the thing that really makes it stand out is that it has a polygon around it. It has, it has the parking areas. It has the walking paths. Uh, it really stands out on the map. And this is the OpenStreetMap default rendering. And you can see it in one of um, MapSense tile sets. This is called Bubble Wrap, this particular style. And it's not as impressive, in my opinion, as how it's rendered in OpenStreetMap, but it still looks, it looks incredible. Um, if we take a look at this on, in another rendering package or another set of tiles, it kind of looks like, wow, um, it's missing. Um, actually, it's not. It's there. It's just represented as a point. And so you can see that if you enhance a feature by adding a polygon, like digitizing the buildings or digitizing the grounds, it adds visual prominence to that feature on the map. And this is a very important feature. This convention center in Portugal is really well known, and a lot of people travel there to attend trade shows. So. In our post, we wanted to highlight some of those features. So in this case, we had a post where we encouraged people to edit schools that were only represented as points. And we wanted to highlight those schools because it's hard to tell that it doesn't have a polygon. You see the name of the school, you see the building for the school, but you might not notice that the grounds haven't been digitized. So we can highlight those. And we did the same thing with hospitals. And you can see here that I'm interacting with with uh, people that are editing based on the targeted editing series and inviting myself to their homes because they live in amazing places and they're doing amazing things and helping by uh, editing features in OpenStreetMap. So these are examples of, of the types of things that we're trying to encourage when 
we think of uh, edits that contribute to display. And a last main category is search. People search for everything. They search, but predominantly it's addresses and venues. So you might be looking for that great coffee shop that is gonna expose you to Seattle's best. You might be looking for a place to ship because you've picked up so many t-shirts in the last couple of days, you can't fit them all in your bag. Um, you might be looking for a building. Does anybody recognize either one of these buildings? Somebody says the Empire State Building. <laughs> How many of you are familiar with the Empire State Building? Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you know the address to the Empire State Building? Oh, okay, I see your geocoder. She is sitting in the back row. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, you really need to have the names of features in addition to the address components because people search for things in many different ways. You can rely on this one young lady here to tell you where the Empire State Building is, or you can add the name so that people don't have to rely on the address to get to these features. So, popular posts. These are the success baby posts. There's something that they have in common. They all involve highway tags. Now, maybe this is no big surprise because it's open street map, but it's really exciting. Like, people really care about the, the road network within open street map, and the post that we did on the transit colors really blew up. People were really excited about it. So what you're seeing in those columns is the views. It's the unique um, visitors to the blog post. This is like collected with Google Analytics. And then the tiles is the number of tiles that were served for these maps. So this is saying people came to the blog post and they actually interacted with the map. They searched, they dragged the map around, and they, they edited things. It's pretty exciting. And then unfortunately we have this one here. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, these topics just didn't do very well. I don't know if it's just that for stadium parking, we don't have a big sports contingent within OpenStreetMap editors. Um, I don't know if people just are bored with airports, polygons, or, or if you just don't care about money. But um, these posts just, they didn't have as much traction. So it's, it's an interesting um, thing to think about. Like, what, what do people want to edit? What kind of features do they relate to? So if, you want to, in, if you're interested in the entire um, set, this graph is interactive, and you can access it in, um, from our website. It's part of a blog post that's about the targeted editing series. And while you can't read it very well, the reason why I, I put this up on the slide is because I want you to see how um, it, there's like a trend up and down. It's overall, the series is something that people are interested in and interact with, just some posts are more popular than others. And the dotted line that's going across the chart is the time on page, like how much time are people spending reading about the particular features that we're trying to introduce them to. And some really, some, there are some surprises. Um, as you would suspect, the highway tag post got uh, more time on page, but then a few really jumped out, like the fitness centers and the hospitals. People spent a lot of time reading those posts, which I'm very grateful for. Um, or it could mean that they're much more difficult to uh, edit than I expected, and there was a lot of back and forth trying to figure out, like, how, like what do I do for this hospital? So um, it's a really interesting um, way to look at the data. So now we have these posts, you have an idea of what the targeted editing series is about. How do we identify what to highlight in those maps? Well, it has a lot to do with the tags. And if we look at this one example for a travel post that we had, the first thing was, well, let's do, let's highlight hotels. And so you start on the OSM wiki and you just type in hotel and it will find the wiki page that describes how to tag these particular features. And that's the thing that we want to communicate to the users. Here is the way that is uh, the expected way to tag a hotel. So we find these tags. But the thing that you have to understand about OpenStreetMap is that the tagging scheme is very heterogeneous. There are many ways to tag things. And you'll see that at the bottom of, um, of any wiki page in OpenStreetMap, there's usually a link to um, tag info. And you can click on that, and you can find other variants. So in this case, I did that, and I thought, OK, 
amenity equals hospital. You really, not sh you really shouldn't tag things this way, but I know that it's very common, so let me just see how many examples there are. And I'm going through, and I'm like, oh, look at this. There's one with like almost 700, amenity equals love hotel. I should add that. I wonder what that's, ooh. <laughs> it's in the query. I put it in the query. I mean, it's, it's a, somebody might go there for a vacation, so I, we want, I don't want to leave anybody out. So, But you have to go through tag info and find these different tag variations. And this is the adventure. It's like going to an amusement park. I mean, there's ups and downs, and sometimes you just get overwhelmed. And the next thing you know, you have this pile of tags, and you, you compile them all together, and, okay, I'm ready. I think I have the whole collection of things that represent places that you might stay when you go on vacation. And what do I do with these now? So this is where the tiles come into play. I have to deliver my SQL to the MapSend TilesN team because the tiles that we serve at MapSend only have a subset of all of the OpenStreetMap data. And if I'm going to highlight something, I, I, I want to make sure that those features are there. So once I give these um, queries to the tiles people, they're great because they often identify whether or not I've missed something. And if I'm really lucky, this I mean, this rarely ever happens. I might identify something that they aren't aware of, and then I'm the hero for the day, like, oh, we should add this. So when that happens, it totally throws the schedule off. They're like, oh, this is great, but we don't have in the towels yet, so don't publish the post. And I'm like, but I know, I, I'm ready. <laughs> So they have all these different tile sets that I can choose from, and, um, and I chose Zinc. Uh, there's another one called Refill, and I love Refill. It reminds me of um, Stamen's Toner, if you're familiar with that map style. It, it happened to be developed by the same cartographer. Her name's Geraldine. She's fantastic. Um, but at the time, when I started the series, uh, the Refill style had less OSM tag features in it than Zinc. So that's why we went with Zinc. But Zinc's amazing. Zinc has this really great, crisp, gray gradient of shades, and it's really going to help me to highlight the features that I want to highlight. So if I have these roads here, and, um, and I want to highlight the segments that don't have names, like I'm trying to think of what's a good color. Well, I mean, obviously, the first thing that comes to my mind is red. And it's gray. The red, it really pops. It looks amazing. I'm like, this is, this is how I want to start my blog post series. I want to have these maps with the gray and the red. And then the more I worked on it and the more development I did, I realized this is not sending the message that I want to send because I don't want to send the message that it's wrong and red communicates something negative or something wrong or stop. And that's not what's happening here because, yes, these segments don't have names, but it, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have names in real life. It could be that that uh, it's a place where the population relies more on the locality as opposed to the actual street name. Or it could be that it's digitized as a dual carriageway where there's actually two representations of the road, and one of them has the name on it, and the other one doesn't. And so red is probably not the good choice to go with. So that's how we ended up switching to aqua. Now, aqua, as you can see, it's very similar to cyan, and a lot of people that start in, out in OpenStreetMap editing, have a little bit of GIS background, and cyan is a very common color used to highlight features. So I figured, oh, this will be something that people can relate to. It pops, it's bright, it, it matches well with the gray. I go, okay, this is the way we're gonna go. So I'm really happy I took some time to think about it before I put out a bunch of maps with red um, highlighted features on them. So once we have the, uh, the map in place, and we're able to highlight features based on the SQL that I have delivered to the tiles team to make sure that they exist on the, feature, on the map, um, I want to create this interactivity. I want you to be able to mouse over the features and get a little pop-up that will allow you to um, access an editing environment. And, and so that's what you're seeing here. This is some, some JavaScript wizardry between me and a few other engineers at MapSend uh, spread out across the country, like West Coast, East Coast. It was a collaboration to get this running. And we had a few requirements that we wanted. One, we wanted you to be able to um, edit in, in uh, JAWSM and also an ID. But we also, what, what happens if like, you're looking at this map, you're looking at the top right map where we're trying to get you to add gyms, 
and or like fitness centers, and you say, hey, uh, you're missing a gym that's next to the funky door. It's, 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 not, it's, it's not there at all. Um, what can you do? So we wanted to be able for you to shift click anywhere on the map and still bring up an editing environment and be able to add new features that are missing altogether. And then we have a lot of developers that use our tiles, and, um, and those folks really care about the data itself within the tile. So this data here, it's, it's a vector tile, and the topo JSON is there. Like, people want to see exactly what's happening in that particular tile. So if you option click the map, you see the topo JSON. So if you're, if you're into that type of representation of the data, we want to make that available as well. So, this is what will happen. You, you click on one of those links, and not only does it take you to ID, in this case, that was the link that I chose, it highlights that same segment that you hovered over in the previous map. And this was something that was really important to me because as you saw in the, in the very first slide or the second slide, there were so many things to edit, it was overwhelming. I don't wanna just send you to the coordinates in the map because you'll spend a whole lot of time trying to re-identify the feature that didn't have the name. This way, it's already highlighted for you and you can easily add the name and save and you've, you've contributed to OpenStreetMap. So we've talked about topics, tags, and tiles. And um, we've seen a tremendous growth in the number of features since each one of these tile, each one of these posts was published. And uh, while we can't say how many of those edits can be attributed to the targeted editing series, we can say that we're really excited to have been a part of the process of inspiring new editors and old editors to add things in their local communities and abroad by making it easier to see the unseen. So with that, I wanted to provide you with all the links. If you go to the very top one, indiehurt.github.io and scroll to the bottom of the page, you'll find a link to all the slides. And in addition, there's a whole blog post. So for those of you that give talks and you think, oh, what if I forget to say something? I was so less worried about that because there's a blog post and you can read all the details and I'm Indie Mapper at, on Twitter. Please send me any details that you think of um, after the presentation if you, don't, if you don't have your question answered today. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have about two and a half minutes for questions. Thank you, good presentation. Um, uh, as I improve um, rail infrastructure and transit routes, I found and discovered your, your very intriguing transit colors render. And um, particularly in, in like very dense areas where there's a lot of transit routes, like in San Francisco on Market Street, you've got, you've got BART subway at the bottom, you've got Muni light rail still underground, but on top of that, and then on, on the surface level, you've got tram routes. What does your router, what's your router supposed to do when it gets like multiple layers on top of each other? I mean, do you, do you render the most recent one that got changed? What, how is that supposed to work or look? So that's an excellent question. It, it, it's a question of how do you display things that draw on top of each other? Like they're all in a coincident location. And right now we don't have any way to, to spread out those six lines on market so that you see the red line, the blue line, the green line, and then the, and the, and the black line all going down the same road. But the exciting thing is that we are working on that, and we're working on it in two separate teams at MapSend, so it's really exciting. We have Transit Land, um, we have Megan Hayde, who is actively working on uh, a rendering engine to be able to display those separate colors um, so they don't just all draw on top of each other. And then we also have the TileZen group who are also working on ways to render uh, coincident transit lines. Takes a little bit of uh, adju like adjusting of the data without, it's like you, ha you need a cartographic representation on top of the real representation to be able to spread those lines out and provide a rendering um, alternative. Uh, 
Uh, well, the 3D view would be quite interesting for the, sa the stations, the substations. I think we might be quite a ways off from that. <laughs> but, um, but the ability to, um, to shift them so that they display as a row is something that we're actively working on. You're welcome. Ask uh, when you when you showed the uh, statistics for New Delhi and the primary and the motorways, the mm -hmm. percentages. Did you just not include the percentages of residential roads that didn't have names, or I mean, that was just you only had like two colors represented there. Uh, but uh, yeah, motorway and, and primary, I thought. But. Uh, no internet. Um, uh, uh, for the slide, I only included just those two, and I, I um, clicked off the other ones in the graph. But if you go to the blog post, you'll be able to see all of the different um, road types, or just the ones that I chose, which is residential, tertiary, secondary, primary, and motorway. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting. Um, in all cases, of all the, I looked at 45 cities uh, across the world. Um, the percentage of unnamed segments, the, the, the total kilometers, uh, was always highest in residential. Um, and of course, we care about the residential roads, but at least the, the highest order roads are usually well represented with names. Yeah. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you, Indy. Mm -hmm. <laughs>